Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. I've got, where's my timer? Right here. Okay. Oh, there. I don't even need glasses for that. All right. So I'm going to have 10 minutes to talk to you about turf grasses and the very small part of the research that we do with turf grass management at Auburn University. Why is it doing that? There we go. So I'm going to specifically talk about one case study with Bermuda grass and compaction and the underlying effects of soil. Bermuda grasses are adapted only to the southeast part of the United States, a little bit into the west with irrigation. Any football game that you will be watching, unless they can simply not manage turf grass and have to use artificial turf, will be played on hybrid Bermuda grass. Anything you watch in the northeast will be played on another grass called Kentucky bluegrass. I use the term hybrid bluegrasses because most of the Bermuda grasses that we grow and manage in the southeast are indeed an interspecific hybrid. And because they're an interspecific hybrid, the mules are your clue that they are what? What can't they do? They can't reproduce. They are sterile. Therefore, all of our Bermuda grasses must be reproduced or planted by sprigging, where we put in the vegetative plant material, or we lay the sod. And what that leads to is some specialty management tactics and way that we take care of these Bermudas. And over time, so here's our sprigging, and over time, they will start to segregate and look patchy. That is the old practice field at Auburn. Now it's occupied by the 100-yard indoor practice facility. Up to two years ago, if you had looked at Jordan Hare when it was not painted, it would have looked exactly the same. It was loaded with what we call off-types. Regardless, I talk a lot about Jordan Hare. We, look, we work with a lot of very high-end athletic facilities. But these are the facilities where we tend to spend a lot of our time. These are the local primary schools, the high schools. Many of you, if you've played any sport, you have probably played on a field that looks like this. They are not safe, they are dangerous, and we need to do things to improve their quality. Other things that happen are layering effects. As those fields wear out, people get the bright idea to put two inches of peat moss on top of it, followed by sand, followed by some concoction that Uncle Bob swears will work, and we get this sort of a problem. So the research that we do looks at how we renovate and bring back fields, specifically core aeration. So on the left, we have what we call the standard rig. It's about four inches deep with these hollow or solid aerification tines. On the right, we have a very severe aerifier, seven eighths inch diameter, hollow or solid tines will go eight to nine inches deep in the soil. On the other end of the scale is what we fondly call the dinky rig. We can get this at Lowe's at Home Depot for about $300. You put it on the back of your mower, you throw some cement blocks in there, grab a beer, and off to town you go. But it's important to have this sort of stuff in our trials because it is the piece of equipment that I see at a lot of high school municipal complexes. One of the problems with turf grass is measuring the results. If this was the cotton growers meeting, I'd have one factor yield. Turf grass has color, it has quality, it has playability, it has responsiveness. We use things like a clay hammer where there is a weight that is dropped onto the turf surface and we measure the resiliency, the hardness of the turf surface. This is the standard technique used by the NFL to test for field safety. Does it work? Yes. So here is the clay reading, soil hardness. When we use the big rig here with either hollow or solid tines, we significantly soften the turf surface. Why do we care? Because we are now getting to the point where we have documented, demonstrated plague numbers that we are trying to link to the threat of concussive injury. One of the other things we work with is soil hardness. So instead of just at the top of the surface, as measured with the device I just showed you, this is a load-bearing rod that you insert all the way through the soil, and you're measuring the degree of compaction. We do this in football fields, and we also do this in equine turf. This is an advanced level fence at an Olympic level course. You would sail over that, hopefully staying attached to your horse as you go. One of the concerns, indeed, is horse and rider safety. So we do a lot of work in that area. Other things we do are things like slip, measure of turf clipping yields. This is a torque meter. If you are of a certain age and you ever set torque on a car, you know you turn the wrench, and you turn and you turn, and at some point it slips, and you get a Newton meter measure. Here we have nitrogen, and as the nitrogen rate goes up, 
This number goes down. Why? We're growing more leaf area and the turf is getting slippery. So at a recommended nitrogen rate for Bermuda grass, we have maximum stick. A player sticks their foot in the turf. They don't turn. They get good clench. They're less likely to have high ankle injuries. So going back to the penetrometer, up here's the picture. This is the rod that's inserted into the ground, and we measure how well the rod goes through the soil. Up here at the top is resistance. So over here is a heavily compacted soil. Over here would be no compaction at all. To set the scale, right here, 2,500 kilopascals, is where a root can't get through the soil. A root's not very happy growing. This is depth from the surface to about six inches deep. Here is no aerification, and you see we have compacted soil. When we take this big tine and we put it in the soil and pull the core out, we get a highly significant reduction in compaction. So we are helping the field to recover from wear and tear. Roots can grow down. We can grow more Bermuda grass. We see the results with the smaller rig up here at the surface, which makes sense. It's only going about four inches into the soil. But what this lets us do is tell people what kind of aerification they need for their event. A lot of times golf courses, to get in profits, will host things like Concours de Elegance. They'll have car shows on the fairway, which cause a lot of compaction. Uh, we will run things like, oh, you know, a Kenny Chesney concert on a stadium, and we will look at big aerification devices to try to solve the underlying compaction. If you simply have surface compaction, a more affordable and smaller piece of equipment will work. But it doesn't mean it always works. So here's the same piece of equipment, but this time with hollow tines. We aren't pulling any soil out. We're doing the equivalent of shoving a pencil into the soil over and over for two years in these plots. And look what we've done. Our red triangles are no aerification. The circles, remember, increased compaction goes this way we have actually created a little compaction pan, a layer, at the bottom of the base of the tine. Using the same piece of equipment over and over has actually created a problem. Now, we've known about this for 200 years in plowing. We call it the plow layer. But this was some of the first work that showed you can do it with a piece of aerification equipment. Why does it matter? If you are a fairly low budget school and you have one piece of aerification equipment, you can create this. How are you going to fix it? Borrow your neighbors, go deeper, or use hollow tines. We only saw this problem with solids. What about the dinky rig? Was there anything behind it behind sheer entertainment value? And the answer was yes. Any type of aerification improved root growth, and that cool little thing increased the shoot density of the Bermuda grass. So it did stimulate some growth of the Bermuda. It didn't help compaction at all but it did encourage the grass to grow. Now, we do work in the high end with a lot of our work. Funding cycles drive that kind of interest. But one of the other areas where we do a great deal of work is in integrated pest management and the management of turf grasses for low end use. And this is an example over on campus. These are my research plots where for the past seven years, we have been putting on different rates of nitrogen fertilizer so that I can tell Alabama homeowners where they need to be with their fertilization to grow a nice home lawn. Now, what do you think my big, beautiful square of clover represents? What has that clover not gotten for seven years? Nitrogen. Clover is a legume. There hasn't been any nitrogen. And the native clover said, we'll take care of this gap and fill it. But if you are interested in a dual species lawn and attracting bees, there you go. So, you know, sometimes home lawns can span from the very finest football stadium in the state to some really wonderful low input segments. And with that, I am done. I have 49 seconds left. <laughs> Thank you all.